Hello friends, I am here today to discuss some of the work that my lab has been doing for the past couple of years in the context of mitochondrial diseases. It is very well known that most rare diseases have a genetic origin and so is the reason with mitochondrial diseases where they do have a, their origin in our genetic material. They can be maternally inherited, they can be somatic in nature. So today the talk will delve into the details of the applications, the tools, the novel algorithms we have developed in this area. So as you can see that the title of my presentation is Integrated Web-Based Platform and Novel Fingerprinting Ontology for Genotype-Phenotype Correlations in Mitochondrial Diseases. So in context of rare diseases, we do all understand that rare as per the dictionary meaning means that the, the disease may not be a very common occurrence in a population. But even the, despite that, the definitions of rare disease in European Union versus the USA versus in Asia do vary. It actually tells you that despite the term being rare, there are 70 million people diagnosed with rare diseases in India alone and put together over 300 million people in the world suffer from these diseases. So the term rare is a misnomer. The cumulative numbers of people who are suffering from these diseases is very very large and we have in our recent publication have identified the resources, the challenges and have recommended the way forward in context of what should we do in terms of understanding these rare diseases and find solutions to them. Now we did an exercise to map rare mitochondrial diseases in India and in Europe. And as you can see here, a large number of rare mitochondrial diseases are listed here. But their prevalence or the number of reported cases both in EU and India, you can see that reporting is very very poor. The reason being, it is very hard to diagnose a rare disease. There is lack of awareness that there can be a rare disease and hence, subsequent analysis and treatment also becomes progressively difficult. Now why uh, rare diseases are difficult or mitochondrial diseases are difficult to understand? Now if you see here, this is a typical eukaryotic cell. Now in a typical eukaryotic cell, there are multiple mitochondria. Within each mitochondria, there can be multiple number of their own DNA. These are semi-autonomous organisms. And then you see that the point is that if mutations happen in these DNA, mitochondria actually can show dysfunction. Now the mitochondrial DNA is a small DNA, circular DNA of only 16,500 odd base pairs, coding for 13 genes, 22 tRNAs and 2 rRNA genes. However, in addition to this small set of genes encoded by mitochondrial DNA, there are more than 3000 proteins which are encoded by the nuclear DNA, which are very important for mitochondrial function. Now, if you look at the number of mitochondrial genomes that have been sequenced in past 10 years, you see that it's only in past 2 years, you see that the number of mitochondrial genomes sequenced for medical research is actually taking speed. It's actually many people are now sequencing mitochondrial DNA also in addition to the nuclear DNA to understand how disease manifestation happens. As also there are more than 250 point mutations and more than 200 different genomic rearrangements that are implicated in mitochondrial dysfunction and most of these uh, polymorphism or mutations are studied in, in context of single nucleotide changes which are called as SNPs. Now this is a schematic representation. So if you see this is a mitochondria, this is nucleus. Now this is the electron transport chain. You see here the subunits uh, which are shown in green are nuclear encoded. The subunits shown in red are mitochondrial encoded. Now you see the complex interplay between the nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Now if mitochondrial dysfunctions it is very hard to assign a causal role to either of these genomes. As also the clinical representation of these diseases is very complex because mitochondria not only generates is the powerhouse of the cell and generates energy, it is involved in a large number of central metabolic pathways. 
and thus the, the symptomatic or the clinical presentation of the disease becomes too complex and it is very difficult to then map the genotype to the actual phenotype. Now what do you do in, the, do in such cases? So that will come to later on in the talk. But as, for, as of now there are a large number of tests which are available in clinic but none of those tests are unambiguously affirmative. They don't give you a 100% accurate result on diagnosis and hence the Mitochondrial Medicine Society has recommended the next generation sequencing as the first line of diagnosis for mitochondrial diseases. Now this is a paradigm shift. As opposed to a couple of years ago and even now, it's the clinical evaluation followed by sequencing. But now people are saying you should sequence it first, followed by clinical evaluation and put the two together to make an assessment of the disease diagnosis, which is the case with mitochondrial diseases. Now even when this was not the case, very early on in our lab, we have published MedSNP score. Now it actually uh, does a combined evidence-based approach. So if you compare one normal human's mitochondria to another normal person's mitochondria, of 16,000 odd base pair, you will find on an approximate 500 differences. If you compare a disease versus a normal, you still find 500 differences. Now you don't know which of these differences are actually important in disease causation. And that is when we have developed a prioritization pipeline where we identified that rare variants are disease associated mostly in case of mitochondrial diseases. And this pipeline works on a very simple uh, logic of assigning scores. So we actually have categorized it into multiple sections which I will not be describing today. But the point is anything which is already reported is again given scores between the range of 1 to 10. The, mother, the bigger the score, the higher the chances of that mutation being pathogenic. So here if you see start and stop codons are given a score of 10 because you know they will have issues in terms of when a protein translates, the protein will not be functional. So likewise, the scores are given to all of the predictive methods, what is reported in literature and what you have assessed from literature is important. When we applied this to seven different type of disease association studies which included both metabolic as well as neurodegenerative, you see that almost half of the variance between patients and the control groups show a frequency difference but they are not causative. If you see the red bar here, so practically only 3 to 4 percent of the total variations were prioritized and we propose that they probably have a causative role in disease manifestation. While we were doing this study and we were trying to map this data to what is published in literature, we realized that a lot of people uh, claim the same variant to be novel multiple times. So to overcome that problem, we actually thought it will be good to have a central repository of all what is known and in what context of the disease and in which population. So we actually developed MitoLSDB. It is as of now the largest repertoire of genomic variation data on mitochondrial genomes in context of disease pathology. So the data and coverage includes uh, information on more than 5,000 individuals over 675 populations in 27 different phenotypes. It captures data on all the 37 genes and as of now has more than 1,32,000 variants of which 5,000 odd variants are unique. Now this actually is a community editable platform. So if you identify a novel variant which is not already present here, Anybody in the world can come and submit the variant on this platform. So it becomes easy because then the people discovering, making new discoveries have an option to come and edit this. And with time, the data becomes updated progressively. Now, as I told you early on that 13 protein coding genes are basically coded by the mitochondrial DNA. There are over 3,338 proteins that we have identified which are encoded by the nuclear DNA. Before, when we, like before this exercise, there were only 1,500 1500 odd proteins which were implicated in mitochondrial function. 
and we have definitely increased their repertoire and we have mapped all the pathogenicity, pathogenicity predictions to all possible variants generated in this data set. Now again we wanted to repeat the same analysis. We wanted to know which of these nuclear encoded proteins have been implicated in diseases and in which population and there are a large number of resources to check for that. You have DBSNP, you have the 1000 Genome Projects, OMIM, the Online Mendelian Inheritance and Man Resource, so you have GWAS Central, DBWAR, DBGAP, Genetic Association Database. When we were doing this exercise, we realized that it is so difficult to collect data from all these resources and map to the data that we have because they all follow very different ontology or the language to communicate the data. So we thought that why not bring in some standardization in representation of a genomic variation data itself. No matter which language one person uses, no matter how you represent data, but if we all can translate it into or map it into forms of zeros and ones, then all data can be connected onto a central pool. And that is what we called as FROG, Fingerprinting Ontology of Genomic Variations. So I'll give you a simple example. It has six different blocks. One of the blocks being DNA, much simpler to understand. So say for example, if there is a change in DNA, what all will possibly change? We have tried to map it here. Say for example, the DNA can have a, if a variation kind where it can reach to indel or translocation or inversions. It can have a transition type, it can have transversion types. There can be gene fusion changes, there can be change in the functional level, there can be change in the structure, there can be epigenetic variation. So all possible changes that can happen at the level of DNA are described in terms of attributes and then each attribute in turn is defined by a set of terms. Let's look at another example. This is for DNA, now this is for protein. Now a protein, you can actually see that there are 8 different attributes and 78 different terms, terms in which you can actually classify any possible change happening to a protein. So we did this exercise for 6 levels, chromosome, DNA, RNA, protein, variation and interactions. It all can be presented in 48 different attributes and 278 different terms. So this is with extensive understanding of how variation impact at different levels, we have mapped it. The second level what we did, say for example, we are representing the variation ontology here, the variation block. Now the entire variation can be represented in 18 bits. Say for example, if I say that the first two numbers in a variation bit are 0 and 1, it actually tells me it's a maternally inherited change. If the third position of the variant is a 0, it tells me it's a single nucleotide change and not an insertion deletion. Likewise, the fourth position, if it is a 1, it tells me it's a synonymous change. So, when you translate or start representing these terms in form of combinations of zeros and ones, they are called as bits. So, practically all of this data that you see here can be represented in form of these 0 1 combinations and actually what this will offer. So if you look at the next slide, it actually tells you that 36, 58, 36 terms here and overall 276 terms can be represented as in as low as 102 bits. That is all what you need to represent such huge amount of information now on every position in the genome. So it makes it definitely computationally efficient but it also simplifies the data for genotype, phenotype correlations. We have applied this logic on MitoLSDP dataset and this is how it generates the DNA level fingerprint, the protein level fingerprint and the variation level fingerprint. And as you can see there, any star represents that. We don't really have information on those particular bits as of now. Ontologies are inherently difficult to be understood by biologists. So we wanted that uh, biologists should use it and to simplify the entire process we have created this online system where I would recommend all of you to go use this interface, ask questions and see how ontology is trying to simplify it, how representations of 0 and 1 may help you segregate between different disease phenotypes and may help in identification of potential biomarkers. 
Now, as I told you, we have discussed mid step score today. We have discussed mito LSDB. We have discussed frog, but we haven't really discussed all the applications and tools that we have developed till date, or which are publicly available. So we decided that when all of these tools are available, why not put all of them together onto a common platform so that it is easier for the end user to use this as a computational engine. And that is what we have done now. We have created MitoLink. Now MitoLink has data resources both from the nuclear DNA as well as the mitochondrial DNA. It actually houses tools which allows you to do variation data analysis. it allows you to visualize data it allows you to do a lot of routing jobs in terms of file format converter gene mapping or sequence retrievals so this is a complete package where you need, it's basically a cloud architecture you need not to install anything on at your end if you have your own data sets you can use this entire pipeline for data analysis it looks something like this where all the tools are listed here the analysis outputs are shown here and the files that are generated are coming in your history panel now it makes it easy for you to make changes here and there in which in multiple steps and rerun the workflows the advantage is the workflow can be saved as is and it actually ensures data reproducibility which is a huge problem so now you can use these platforms for uh, search analysis and simple sequence retrieval and mapping the next step or the plan is to include clinical data in this because if now you have variants from different individuals and the clinical parameters it allows you to prioritize and identify clinically actionable variants and when it comes to rare diseases that is exactly what you want can you map clinically actionable variants in context of the clinical data and identify or help in diagnosis of such diseases faster because as of now they are extremely difficult so i am looking for clinical collaborators who have this data and all the tools that i have developed are anyways available online for you to use but they need to be customized for different disease sets i am part of the mitochondrial disease sequence data resource consortium and trying to see that the tools that i am developing are actually in sync with the rest of the world and they are used uh, by in combination with the other tools people are developing worldwide i am on the expert panel on mitochondrial dna specific concerns so i'm helping people try to identify mitochondrial uh, the pathogen the pathogenicity of mitochondrial dna variants our uh, pipeline has already been used by some clinicians and researchers in university of california san diego where the objective was very different they were trying to see whether nephrotoxicity is associated with hiv or is it associated with hiv treatment and one of the criteria for nephr nephrotoxicity is to actually judge whether there is mitochondrial toxicity that you can see in kidneys so we applied a exosome based proteomics analysis and have identified that mitochondrial specific proteins are found in drug treated hiv patients now this actually is an application of we have something that we have developed in an area which is absolutely different from the research area that we are working on so it's basically depends on how people want to use the pipeline in pipeline and in what what context and we really like people to use it so the way forward is definitely that you we know that despite the uh, progress that has happened in clinical settings in terms of disease diagnosis the diagnosis of mitochondrial diseases is still imperfect in terms of sensitivity and specificity we need to club the clinical diagnosis along with the next generation sequencing data and systems level uh, interaction maps to be able to have a personalized system based modeling both for prognosis and disease diagnosis so definitely the way forward is you need ngs data the next generation sequencing data as also you need systems based models that could help identify or personalize the medicine and that is what the objective of our lab is today what i have discussed with you is this part of my lab's work where we deal with trying to understand mitochondrial diseases most of which are categorized as rare diseases 
but my, the my, a major part of my work also deals with uh, uh, computational drug discovery and we de have developed a large number of tools either from my lab or in collaboration with other groups that is something that I haven't discussed for all the students out there this is this should be a very very motivational message now we published a paper last year in nature scientific reports and this paper is important because uh, not just because it is the first ever web server for antibiotic prediction with a very very high accuracy it's also because the work done in this paper was done by a student who was work like was in her 12th standard so a school kid has done work worth an international peer review journal so practically means that there cannot be any educational criteria if you are passionate enough to solve a problem you will solve it so i thought this was important for all the students out there who are looking to take up research as careers all the work that i have shown you today is not coming from my uh, phd is not coming from my phd group uh, it is the work is done by avinya shamna and pankaj and neeraj who is here so practically the uh, you it actually tells you that a lot of work done is being done by people who have visited my lab for 6 to 8 months and that is what you can practically achieve in that time i would like to thank uh, genesis open source drug discovery gentofen for all the financial support i am available on all these twitter handles skype and my email ids and i would like to thank friends uh, and colleagues from csir if there are questions if you don't if you are not understood anything i am available online i am available on my email please free, feel free to contact me and i sincerely hope that we need not celebrate the rare diseases day year after year and we are we can contribute enough that we stop recognizing this day altogether at some point in time in our lifetimes thank you very much